So, Captain, you want to tell us what you're looking at? I don't know. Is this for the opening or for the end? That'd be a good shot if he was if he was back there looking through the hole. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's my star log shot. Right. We could do that. <laughs> One of the things that David did throughout the production is push the visual style. Um, if you look at the you know the scenes in the car, or if you look at the design of the alien and what David wanted it to be, a freight train meets a jaguar with a speed and an agility that we had never seen in any of the Alien movies. And, and this enabled him to do things with the camera that could not be done in prior movies. The alien running across the ceiling, all these different things. And David was always pushing that and pushing people to go beyond what they would expect their own capabilities to come up with unique and, and, and different techniques. That was one of the challenges of the production, that is, to come up with a technique of shooting the alien. How would we shoot the alien? How would we create the alien in this movie? Nobody had ever seen the alien running in the way that he was running. He runs on the ceiling, on the side, all over the place. We had to develop a look. How does an alien look when it runs? From a practical standpoint, the, uh, the idea of putting a man in a rubber suit uh, um, it works because it, because you get the coverage you need and, and you have something to, to work with on set and the actors have something to work with. Um, a lot of this movie is going to be a third scale puppet. I mean, it, in fact, we're, we're hoping that, that most of the time that you see the creature, it's going to be the puppet because it's, it's just got things to it that, that you can't do with a man in a suit. There's always a, a size when you're dealing with puppets that you, that you want to strike, is the, which is the right size because gravity is one of the problems that you're dealing with in trying to coax life out of rubber, which is, which is basically the, the, the task. It was a very difficult project to get the alien to look menacing and terrifying in motion. Stop motion is too jerky. I mean, it looks, that's out of date. I mean, you can't, you can't have a character running in the scene uh, without, without the natural motion blur that you'd expect to see. And it's because it, it looks herky-jerky. So that was, uh, you know, not, uh, that was not uh, a, a useful approach at all. I had worked before with a guy back on the first Star Wars. His name was uh, uh, Lane Liskett. Uh, and he was very good at stop motion animation. And we wanted to take the idea of that and use that with rod puppeting, but be shooting it with the motion control cameras. So Richard coined this frame of Mo Motion, and I don't remember why it was Mo, but it was Mo Motion. It's going to be a rod puppet that's, that's composited uh, uh, through a blue screen, so you will have more control over the movement, and we'll be able to go in and, and, and remove control rods frame by frame, rotoscoping things out, and really, really getting some control over the, the movement that way. Fincher wasn't going to buy locked off shots, I mean, not in, in these kind of ferocious scenes, and so uh, so we designed the system that we could pan, tilt, dolly, all, uh, boom, all these things. We shot live action footage in the tunnels and in all the sets back in England with what we called a field recorder dolly that Boss Film had made. And this was a dolly that was built so that the camera could be on it and moved by the first unit people. and the kind of wheels and control arms for, the, for, for panning and tilting and, and booming and tracking in and out were familiar to a regular live action cameraman. But while all this was happening, we had recorders on all the wheels and all the different axes that would be able to record all these axes. We would bring them back to Boss Film. And we would put that same motion file back into our motion control camera here, which would be modified to take in the scale changes. So the dynamic distance would be scaled down to say one third of their, of their actual mo motion. The track length would be one third as long. The boom height would be one third as high. Except the, all the angles on the, on the pan and tilt remain the same. So you take all that information and then you uh, shoot the alien with that same program. And then you can put the alien as a, as, an, as a separately photographed creature into another scene. One of the things that I was involved in was, it was a little bit backwards, but we had to 
we had to retroactively figure out how much the alien would have moved on the set, on the full-size set, and then scale that down. And so I had to know, I had to go and, and from figuring out what lens they had used and knowing what the view, the, the field of view and, and height and width of that lens was, uh, figure out where they were on the set so that we could start some of these setups and know how, how far to move the puppet through this thing. There were things like that that didn't get documented like they might have been because nobody had ever done this before. We also developed a laser disc uh, composite system so that we could take the uh, material that was shot at one frame a second or 48 frames a second and reconfi reconfigure that to 24 frames a second so that we could then put it with the background and see immediately after we shot a take on the stage we could then composite it in video with the background and see if it works. If, and if he missed, if he's supposed to be noshing on a particular actor and he, and he misses it, then you can see. So you, you then move him over and he does this over here or his feet placement and all that kind of stuff can be controlled. And uh, it's, it was pr a really powerful tool and, it, and it's never been able, nobody's ever been able to do it as w uh, with such facility. Uh, without this equipment. So this was all equipment that had to be designed, built, and foolproof and perfect, you know, because the responsibility was on us, uh, you know, in time to shoot it. So it was tough. I know that for, for Lane and the guys that were actually doing the puppeteering, to be doing it in that slow motion as the camera is doing the move, there are some shots where a camera comes around and turns a corner and goes into a hallway and sees the alien eating this guy that's on the, on the ground, and, or, or maybe the alien comes off of the ceiling and goes down. Uh, and so we had to be able to get everything coordinated just right. and, and the puppeteer is in the right position and the alien in the right position without having any of that set there. It would have been far too costly to build miniature sets and far too constraining to have five guys with rod puppets or with r these rods going to the puppet uh, if those walls were in the way. So we had just a few fixtures that would represent perhaps one plane of the wall or one plane of a table or, or a doorway, but these guys were coming at this puppet from every angle except from where the camera was seeing. Yeah, I think the, the knees do give us a kind of talk right, right. Um, yeah, it's got to be really, really cautious of those plants. Make sure to hold, those, hold the plant on the foot as long as possible. When, when you're bruised, then you Oftentimes, David, who was involved in, in each shot, would, would get the puppeteers all going to a point to where they were just barely in control of the creature. And if they, if we, if they had to move any faster, they'd have been just bumping into each other. And by, ha by achieving this kind of, it's like the wily e. coyote going around a corner and, and skidding uh, on, on one level, but, but what, what it achieved was the occasional serendipitous action that made the alien have a character and, and, and made him, uh, or it, terrifying. From the standpoint of our task on Alien 3, we had to create the alien, but we also had to help create the environment. So there are numerous miniatures and matte paintings we did, one of which was the furnace set, which was a pretty nice kind of uh, I don't know, Blade Runner-esque shot. The idea of that whole set came up rather late in the production. Uh, and I remember it being a really low amount of money that they had left to do this. And we're going, oh my gosh, how are we gonna, how are we gonna carry this off? It can't be a matte painting. A matte painting won't have the depth. And, and uh, Richard didn't want it to be a matte painting. He wanted, Richard Edlin, wanted have something that had depth and we could have the fog 
moving through and, and painted almost in layers. Uh, so we came up with a forced perspective set, and I, I, I called it, we always called it the cardboard set, because it was going to be something we knew from the start that had to be just really knock down, drag out, pop it together real fast, uh, and have some fun with it, but, but mostly cardboard and, and foam core and, and uh, use more shadows and, and inferred detail than, than really building a lot, of, a lot of detailed stuff for it. That was a fun set to work on. So this is what you run that big camera with, eh? That big camera boom. Camera's not so terribly big. Well, that's because we don't have a magazine on it right now. We built a uh, miniature emergency escape vehicle that was built into the sides of the Sulaco such that there were a number of these to suggest that there was a larger, much larger crew at one time on the Sulaco. And then we built a, a, about a, I think it's about a three and a half foot EEV and then a much larger, about a 12 or 16 foot wall piece that we would shoot motion control against blue screen and have the, uh, the uh, capsule in slow motion, an arm would come off of it and it would fall back away from the camera and then go off to the side. So we had, we had broken the shot up uh, in such a way that we would first see the, the EEV come out and it would go out of frame and then the camera would go through that same hole and as the camera would turn and pan on the stars we would start to see the edge of Fiorina, the planet, come into frame and, and that was a matte painting and then we'd once again acquire the, the EEV pulling away from us and going off towards uh, the planet. And so that was another motion control shot of the EEV in a different position uh, further away. This is Fiorina. It was supposed to look very toxic, so I played around with toxic materials to make it. it really was. And it's I used snow. razor blades and all sorts of tools to get texture. And okay. then this had to be so large because they had the miniature coming in and turning well, to crash. Way, yeah. yeah. And they, she lands right here. Yeah. in that area. So that area is actually painted tighter. And this, I was picking up some of the plate color in these rust tones. And I remember doing that, looking at the plate. And that's why the rest of it is very loose. They shot the EEV. Um, it was supposed to be burning up. And again, this was way before, way before, but uh, quite a bit before digital compositing. And I remember the guys had all these cool tricks. They were they were painting the edge of the, the tailing edge of it with um, ultraviolet paint. So when they put ultraviolet light on it, it would actually glow from inside. <laughs> really pretty neat. The EEV coming down. That was the one digitally composited shot. They actually mm. animated the little EEV. I think that was hand animated, and then the. The light coming through the clouds, mm -hmm. they were taking the clouds that I had painted and kind of reversing them out so that whatever was dark in the clouds, he could back, he, he made them turn reverse and become light. So as the EV was on fire coming through the back of the clouds, it looked like it was glowing from inside. There's another uh, thing that we built as a miniature that didn't exist in the live action sets and that was this crane arm that was going to be used to pick up the EEV and, and be moving it uh, through the wind and setting it down. That shot was done with painted background, miniature foreground, and a, and a big miniature crane arm. And in order to give it scale, because the audience doesn't know how big anything is yet, and to also give it a sense of reality, we put a couple of people up on top of this miniature escape pod by projecting them on little pieces of cardboard and separate passes. And so they run as silhouettes and their capes are flowing in the breeze. And, and those little touches kind of uh, give the eye a sense of, re of, of, of relief and believability. For my taste, it was a little too sharp edge. Maybe there was a matte line. It's kind of hard to tell because there's a lot of CG junk and dust and garbage kind of blowing through the shot. But I know that the background was shot slightly out of focus to look like it was in the distance, which 
for my for my taste was a little too much of an effect because I would expect to get that on a, on a wide angle shot, but this was essentially made to look like a thousand millimeter lens. You'd never get a focus shift from foreground to background in a lens that wide. And for me, it, it, it really kind of, you kind of noticed it. If you look real close, there's a, um, because we, we did this show at, at Boss Film, which of course was EEG, which is where they did Blade Runner. And so right back here, I've got my homage to Tyrell Corp. You can see the, the big towers off to the side. One of the fun things that we did with David was there is a, a shot of a cross made out of found objects on this planet, out of old rusty found uh, I-beams and metal and stuff like that, and it's in this junkyard. And David had an idea of kind of a proportions of a cross, and he could, he, he could tell us, well, it should look like it's been made out of all these found parts. and. And there's sort of a religion, I guess, that, that the inmates on this planet uh, kind of create. And we were having a hard time, though, really, really getting a drawing or a, or a sketch or anything that would convey what this cross would look like. So to make it fun for the model makers, I said, you know, and everybody wanted to do this cross because everybody wants to do anything that's going to really show up and be a, you know, a, a, a what we call a hero prop on the set. There were four different guys who wanted to do it. So I said, you guys, each one can build a cross on your own time. We'll, we'll show them all to David and he can look at them and make any changes. And the one that gets picked, you get paid for it. But the ones that don't, you just had the fun of doing it. And so that's what we did. We built four different crosses that were all kind of overall the same proportions, but just slightly very different variations, some more rugged, some more uh, hacked out of stuff. And, and, uh, but he had fun with that too. He, he really liked the idea of getting to choose, uh, you know, and, and not having to be so tied down like usually we made him do. <laughs> Wait for the fucking signal! Some things, you'll never see that we built, and, and uh, they were for, for a good reason. There's a shot of this flame front running through the corridors, and you have an up angle on Sigourney and, a, and another man real close, and they turn around and they see this flame blasting through the corridor. Well, they couldn't afford to really do this. It, it would be much too close to the actors to have this kind of flame. If it was uh, a stunt person, you might have them in the background and you do or later on in the scene see stunt people in flames, but you couldn't get that close to the actor with, with the real flames. So what we did was we got the draftings and, and the, the blueprints of the corridor and we made a one-third scale corridor. And we made it with all the major uh, indentations, the major structure of that whole thing but it was all painted black without detail. And the reason was we could do a fire gag in miniature and shoot it at high speed and blast this fire through the corridor and just shoot that, the same kind of up angle we measured where the camera was in the live action set and got the same perspective and everything. And then we had the flame front go through that miniature set. And then when we took the two pieces of footage, the live action, and then this flame front that is basically exposed so that you're only seeing the flames and the fireball from it uh, with the live action and, and bringing up lights on the characters, you'd swear that that flame front's coming right through that corridor. I mean, you, you know, you, you see it, I even see it now and think, oh, that's, that worked out pretty nice. <laughs> And there are shots that work, and there are shots that don't work so good. I mean, I look back on it now, um, and, you know, some of it looks a little funky to me. And there were sequences where we had planned to uh, rod puppet certain aspects of the character on the set. And we tried doing that at one point. Uh, the problem, but then you would have to remove it's like the Bunraku style, where the, you have the, the guy behind the puppet moving the puppet with rods, 
and then you have to lose the the guy, and you have to do that with 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 moving split screens and rotoscope, and and in the photochemical world, it was you know you couldn't do split screens as seamlessly as you can digitally. This was before uh, we were using computers to composite things. Matter of fact, this was one of the first jobs that Boss Film used computers to do any work uh, with film. Usually everything had been done chemically before. And I think that Alien 3 was still composited chemically, but I think we put shadows in of the alien creature onto the walls in, in CGI and computer. Yeah, the shadow elements were, uh, for the most part, CG with some roto help um, from, you know, simple, you know, regular old rotoscope help. The one computer-generated shot is they had to model the head of the alien, which was not that difficult because it was a, it was it was a basically kind of like an oblong football shape. And uh, and then and since we were looking at it from the top, we wanted to see the cracks. So they they modeled the the, the character and uh, and then did a computer animated crack, and it was like on the screen for maybe a second. So that was our first computer generated uh, and digital composite. So it was all done digitally. It was just the start of this whole big wave that became CGI of computer-generated imagery uh, for Boss Film. I mean, it's so easy to do it digitally and, and so difficult to do it photochemically. I mean, just to get a, just to get a, a good mat so you don't get a, you, you have a, you have a, a, a scene where the, the edge characteristic of the, of the creature that you're matting in, it looks right and it doesn't look too sharp or it doesn't look too fuzzy or it doesn't, you know, have a black line on it or whatever, you know. I mean, just to get a, a, a composite without matte lines is like a, is a real feat in the photochemical world. In the digital world, it's like simple, that's, that's automatic, you know. So, I mean, I'm very happy to have been delivered from the sumo wrestling world of photochemistry and, and effects. Thank you.